Okay, I'll, I'll ring the bell and <clears throat> see if you can let your mind ride on the sound of the bell. And as the sound fades away, the tendency of the mind to move or want to engage is released. So the bell, the bell, the sound of the bell releases you until you're just hanging there. You're aware of everything around you. If there are sounds, you're aware of those. If there are other sensations, you're aware of them. But the bell has helped you get away from the thinking part of your mind so that you're just resting with knowing you're present. Okay? Notice the appearance of thoughts. And notice how the mind moves towards thoughts. Tendency to engage. See if you can feel the force of that tendency, how it's pushing your will aside. Mind moving towards thought. Allow it to relax and focus on the support, either breath or sound. Can you become aware of the flow of thought that appears by itself, manifests and then disappears? Thoughts appear, tendency to engage manifests. Do you engage or can you release the thought to go by freely?
See if you can detect the tendency to engage as a force in your mind that is separate from thinking. If you are now thinking, can you free the thought and let your mind rest with your support? Could you say how long it took before the appearance of a thought was followed by engaging? Thought appears, how long was it before you engaged? Instantaneous? Are you developing the ability 
to allow thoughts to appear and be. It seemed a couple of times easier that a thought would appear and start to go with it, and it seemed easier then to not fall than it has. It didn't happen every time, but sometimes it was to drop it, I found just by coming into the body. Excellent. So sometimes it was easier not to. What makes it easier? <laughs> because it felt less tired, less demanding when mm -hmm. I did that and that way you think, oh, why don't I do that all the time? Mm -hmm. um, right. Because there was not an effort required, if that makes sense. Also, <laughs> um, how juicy it was, you know, a little, um, not any big deal thought could appear and just sit there. But other ones that are quite um, actively bothersome at the moment, <laughs> I was away with it. Yeah, they took you away quickly. Yeah. For, for me, I think um, what makes it easier is recognising that there is no consequence. Yeah. That it's just a thought. Recognise it for what it is. Um, in answer to your question as to what makes it easier, um, in my experience, uh, you can actually, uh, a lot of thoughts arise from conflictive emotions which are very strong and drive you away from exploring them. Um, but if you have a safe place uh, where you can actually pause and explore the thought, um, maybe you would say something about some of the practices that would help us to uh, create that safe place, possibly from equanimity or compassion. Do you need a safe place if you are able to accept the appearance of thought? Well, my, and I think your definition of uh, self-compassion is profound self-acceptance. Yes. And that is what you need. So I wonder if you would say something about the practices, the compassion practices that we need mm -hmm. to develop in parallel to mindfulness insight in order to create that state of profound self acceptance, which is a safe place. Yeah. Um, could, could I just mention that um, if the thought is very hurtful, it's much harder not to become engaged. For example, I read in the newspapers recently about the toxicity of carbon dioxide to our soul. And this thought came to me that this is very stuffy, how much carbon dioxide am I breathing in? And then I tried to return to my support, which was breathing. Impossible. <laughs> so if you have a really destructive, painful thought, uh, I agree, you need somewhere safe to go to look at that, because otherwise, Every time you go back to your support, the thought reoccurs and takes over again. Yeah. So do you, go, do you go back to look at thought or do you go back to the support? I, I go back to the support because the idea was to observe the thought arising. But of course going to the support meant it arose again, immediately, focusing on my breathing. I noticed the carbon dioxide. <laughs> So oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I think you got yourself into a corner there. <laughs> the dog definitely helped me. Um, I'm sure it helped us all make that space between thought arising and, uh, you know, give the gap. Yeah. You use the word make. I know it's a bad word. That's a bad word. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's. Well, you know, we often assume that we've got to make things happen. Yes, the sound of the dog initiated a space for me that allowed. 
allowed me to develop time between um, a thought arising and, and registering it and um, staying with the support or with the beautiful sound of the gong. That raises the question also, the gong is such a beautiful sound. The Tibetan sound is so beautiful. Um, whether that is preferential, but they are just <coughs> and they vibrate and all the rest. So the question is, do we need a beautiful sound? No. Uh, obviously a, a highly discordant sound wouldn't be the best option. But when we're using sound as the support, we're not making any choice. Well, the thing is that near my house, ambulances go past and screeching police cars and all the rest of the news. So you can hear any sound and let it be a focus for support. <coughs> yes. Um, I'm just picking up on uh, this thing about a safe place. If we're regarding these as mental events that are spontaneous, not, not with an eye control, it's like mind sweat, it's just happening all the time. If safe place isn't um, easy, it, it's reframing and using metaphor an option for people to try and get a bit of space between whatever's arising and that temptation to, to get involved with it because it sounds like some of the difficulty with not engaging is, is um, a little bit connected to the, the charge that's with something because of our backstories and our tendency to need to explain or to pick at it. So mm -hmm. um, well, the way a reframing fits in, in the way that you're <clears throat> contextualizing with that Yeah, let's, let's go back to our definition of mindful or mindfulness. Knowing what is happening while it's happening and we should add another phrase at the end, without preference. So what we're training ourselves to be is the impartial witness. So we learn to witness our own experience impartially. Now, for most people, that is extremely difficult because we are very concerned about what we're feeling and what we're thinking. Particularly what we're feeling is extremely important to us. So we're always wanting to get in there, manipulate, interfere, change, fix, whatever it is. So, a huge part of our mindfulness training is to witness that tendency, to witness the, the thought or the feeling, and the tendency to engage, and then not to follow through. So, strangely, it's being mindful is largely not doing. So the, the thought comes, the impetus comes to think, and we don't do it, and we don't do it, and we don't do it. Now, that's very, very difficult because most of us have engaged a thought before we consciously realize it. Have you all begun to notice that? The mind is so quick, it engages a thought the moment it appears. So, what that means is that part of our training is to see that, to let go of it, and come back to resting on the support. Then before we know it, we're engaged again and we're thinking. We see that, we let go of it, and we rest on the support. So as we do this, 
the content of the thought process becomes less and less important because it's, it's having less and less time to influence how our minds are. And then we can be impartial. We can then be the impartial witness.